Come on, somebody. I'm all fired up, fired up. It's so good to see you today. Hey, a couple weeks ago, we started a series about being shaped by the Holy Spirit. And last week, we talked about how the Holy Spirit shapes us by His voice. Today, I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit shapes us or being shaped by the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that, that there are some Christians that just seem to have a little more of something that sometimes we don't seem to have. They just have a little more power maybe or a little more favor. Maybe it just seems like God helps them more than he helps us or that maybe he likes them more than he likes us or somehow they got some kind of special access code that we haven't figured out yet and they've got the access code and we don't have the code. Uh, I just need you to know, I just need you to know God does not love somebody else more than he loves you. God paid the same price for each and every one of us, but this would be true. The more I yield to the voice of the Spirit, the more of the power of the Spirit I will see operating in my life. It's not a love issue. It's a surrender issue. So the more I learn to hear, recognize the voice of the Spirit, which we talked about last week, yield to it, surrender to it, the more I will see the power of the Spirit or the results of the Spirit operating in my life. Many Christians are, are like the, the story, little, they're like the, the father who takes his little boy out and they're going out to play, and they end up in this little creek, and they start making this dam. And so the boy's gathering these rocks, and he's putting these rocks in to build this dam. And he comes up to this one rock, and it's a good-sized rock, and he leans into it, and he grabs it, and he's trying to move it, and he can't move it. And the father begins to encourage him, come on, son, you can move that rock if you use all of your strength. So he feels inspired by what his father just said. He goes down there with this new resolve. He goes after that rock with all the grit and gr the muscle he can generate. Pushing on it, nothing. Sliding around, nothing. Father still encouraged him, come on, son, use all of your strength. He's trying. And finally, he just looks up, and he, he's out of breath, and he's breathing. He said, Father says, son, I know if you use all of your strength, you can move the rock. And the son in frustration says, Dad, I've tried as hard as I can, and I can't move it. And the father looks at him and smiles and says, No, son, you've not yet asked me to help you move the rock. And that's the way many Christians live their life. They're trying to do it for God, but without God's help. They're trying to do it in willpower, personal power, personal belief, good reason, good cause, which is noble, but it is limited. All throughout Scripture, we see how the Holy Spirit helped empowered people, shape people's lives, if you also look at Scripture and study it closely. In the Old Testament, there's a story of a young boy. His name was Joseph. Joseph had setback and problems and challenges throughout the course of his life. But the Bible says that God was with him. He was constantly yielding to the leadership of the Spirit. The Spirit of God was with him and eventually gave him the wisdom and the strategy at the end of his life to lead the nation of Egypt through seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. And when his brothers were finally reconciled to him who tried to kill him and sold him into slavery, his comment was to them, what you did was evil. What God did was good. Are you catching this? The, it wasn't an instantaneous moment that demonstrated the full power of God. It was just a life of living in the breeze of the Spirit that was shaping him. And at the end of his life, he looks back and says, look what God has done in my life. It was good. There's another story in the Old Testament of a, of a man. His name was, was Gideon. Gideon struggled with timidity and poor self-image and low self-esteem. But the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him and he got a strategy how to take 300 men to fight over 100,000 soldiers. How many know that's, that's, that's a overwhelming odds against you? Have you ever been in those situations where the odds are against me? I cannot tell you the number of times I've went into something and the odds were against me, but, but God... 
but God. It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't feel good. But God showed up, and God gave Gideon this incredible, miraculous miracle. But it took him moving through the journey of growing in his inner person, growing in his thought life, shaping him to finally giving him a strategy. And when they applied that strategy, it gave them victory, and God blessed them. This is the one that is even really more hard to believe, more incredulous, is story in Judges. It's about Samson. Bible says Samson was walking along and, and, the, and the lion came out and the Spirit of God came up on him and literally gave him the power to physically overpower the lion. And it says he defeated the lion like he was fighting a little lamb. You know, how many know the Bible says the enemy can come as a roaring lion? We don't fight lions, but God says, that's all right. I'll give you my power to fight your spiritual battles with. And so there's a power available for you and I that, that allows us to do the incredible. It allows us to do the supernatural to overcome the odds that are against us. And so when we're talking about this idea of the Holy Spirit or spirit, the word spirit is the Greek word uh, pneuma, and it's, and it's this word that means a current of air. So when you hear the word Holy Spirit, it literally means wind or, 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 or this current of air. And, and it means a breeze, a breath, or a blast of air. This is interesting and fascinating. How many know that words, you can't see words? But have you ever seen the power of words? Has someone ever said to you, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And it created a break. You didn't see the words, but you were impacted by the power of those words. Or you've spoken those words to somebody and you've saw the power of those words change something, impact something. That's the voice of the Spirit. And if I learn to hear the voice of the Spirit, we talked about that last week. It's, it's, the voice of the Spirit is the gentle breeze. But the power of the Spirit is the blast. That's, that's the results of obedience. That's the results of yielding. That's the results of watching that. We said every week in this series that in, in Genesis chapter 1, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth, which was out form and void and darkness. It literally means it was a chaotic mess of desolation, emptiness, and without purpose. The Spirit of God was hovering over it and been spoke into it. When the Spirit of God spoke into creation, there was light. God spoke, there's the results. You don't see the words, but you see the results of the words that God spoke. God says, let there be a foundation, and he spoke it, and there it was. God says, let there be marine life and animal life and plant life. God spoke it, and there it was. And God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed in him. He became a living soul. So God speaks things into creation. Fast forward with me now to the New Testament. One day Jesus is in a boat, and while he's in a boat, there's a storm going on. And Jesus gets up in the middle of the boat and he says to the storm, knock it off. Stop it. And guess what? You didn't see the words, but the Bible says the wind ceased. And I don't know if you've ever been on the water. Sometimes the wind can slow down, but it takes a moment for the waves to calm down. But the Bible says the waves immediately just laid down. <laughs> Creation obeyed his voice. On another occasion, Jesus was walking along, and he saw a fig tree, and he thought there might be some figs on it. And when it had no figs on it, he spoke roundup to it, if you know this story. He says, you are cursed. And the disciples like, whoa. So don't say speaking to your plants don't work. In fact, if Jesus talks to your plant, have him say nice things to your plants. So they come back the next thing, that thing's all dried up. On another occasion, he stands at a grave and he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. In other words, he didn't have to yell or scream. His power wasn't in this, this demonstrative. It was just in the power of when he spoke. Creation obeyed the voice of his spirit. It, 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 the voice was spoken. The power manifested. It's a beautiful story in Matthew chapter 8. Of a soldier, it was a centurion soldier. He's not even he's not even a church going person. He's not even trained in the Jewish culture. He's he's not Christianized or he's not Judaized, and and so he he just comes up to Jesus one day and he says, Jesus, my servant is sick. Will you heal him? 
And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And he says, no, Jesus, you, you don't need to come to my house. And he says something incredibly profound because this guy gets it. He gets it. He gets it. He says, Jesus, I'm a man under authority. I understand how authority works. And, and, and if I say to a man under my authority, because I have authority, therefore there are men under my authority. And if I say to a man under my authority, I need you to go someplace, he will go. If I say to another man, come, he will come. If I tell another one, do this, he will do it. Because I have authority. So when I speak, things happen in the, in the realm of speaking over these men. Jesus, I understand that you have authority over creation. I don't, but you do. And if you speak, my servant will be healed because I understand the power of your words. Am I helping anybody yet? Many of us, though, we're trying to do it in our own power. And today I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit empowers us, how he helps us. So if you have your outlines, follow along. It's in Acts chapter 1. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the gift of my Father. What's, what gift is he referring to? It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Please catch this. You don't work for the Holy Spirit. You don't earn the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is just that. It is a gift that you and I have to learn to receive. We receive it. We don't work for it. We receive it, which my Father has promised you, which you have heard uh, me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But when you but, and you will receive power. That word power there is the Greek word for dunamis. We get the word dynamite from it. It is an explosive, forceful power. In other words, if you've ever seen dynamite go off in a movie or in real life, it is a forceful power. When I was a little boy growing up in the uh, hills of West Virginia, my dad would take me to work with him on, on Saturday mornings, and they would prepare all week. They were strip mining. They would prepare all week, and they would drill all of these holes and put dynamite and blasting caps in these holes, and I would get to go on the weekends and literally watch a whole mountain go up, and come back down. Incredible. Incredible. Sometimes we were too close and we had to jump under the trucks as rocks would start raining down. Every little boy loves stuff like that. Every little mom freaks out. What did you do with my kid? It's like, it was cool. Rocks were coming. It wasn't raining. It was raining rocks. That was the explosive power of dynamite. So most of us know the power of dynamite, and it's a power, it's an explosive power. This is what God is saying, I'm going to give you, he's going to have power, it's going to be explosive power in your life. Now catch this, and you, hang on to the you for a moment, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Is the gospel been going through the millennia since Jesus spoke that? It's never stopped. It's been outlawed. It's been made illegal. It's been, it's been uh, criminalized. It, it's tried to be marginalized. It's tried to be denied. Magazines write, say Christianity's dead. God is dead. For some reason, this thing just keeps going. So for 2,000 years later, without social media, without wealth, without, without publishing, just Jesus spoke something to a group of guys, and it's still going on. It's going to the whole earth. You can't stop it. It's still going to the whole earth. But you will do this. Okay, okay. You got to know your Bible a little bit. The you he is talking to is not this elite, we're going to change the world team. This is not your most highly competent, polished, leadership, visionary, militant, aggressive, take it by force group. This is the same people that when Jesus spent time with them, he said, you have no faith. Oh, you of little faith. This is the same people that he would get so frustrated. He said, how long do I have to bear with you? How long will I have to put up with you? Will you never get it? I'm standing right here. Don't you get it? You ever been felt like that? These are the same people. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We'll never deny you. We'll never quit on you. We're all in, Jesus. We're all in. The day that Jesus needed them the most, gone. 
They're gone. They're like cartoon characters running in every which direction and dust flying up. They're gone. Even after he rose from the dead, he's risen from the dead. People have seen him, but, but one of them hasn't seen him yet, and he's like, I, I don't believe. He's been hanging out with Jesus for three years. Jesus been kept saying, I'm going to raise from the dead, I'm going to raise from the dead, I'm going to raise from the dead. I don't believe it. I don't believe it unless he shows up, and I put my fingers in his sand and in his side, and Jesus shows up. This you, this group of losers, this is the bad news bears. Nobody would have bet on this group changing anything. But Jesus did because he did not ask them to do it in their education, their personal power, their willpower. He says, you will do it with my power. Are you catching it? It's time for some of us to move from trying to do it by ourselves and learn how to let God help us with his power. And that's what I want to talk to you about in the rest of my time. Four distinct ways that we can say, God, I need your power. Like the little boy, God, I need your help. Four ways that God wants to help us so that we can be empowered, not in our power, but with his power, because he wants to shape us by his power. Here, here's the first way. And these are not the only ways, but, but because, because the Holy Spirit is wide and as broad as God is wide and broad. But here's a couple ways we can focus at this morning. Here's number one. He empowers us or gives us power to boldly share Christ, to boldly share and live on missions. What did he say? You will be my witnesses. Listen carefully. God wants you to be his witness. Somebody say, I don't feel like I'm a very good witness. I don't feel like I'm a very good testimony. And some of you are trying to be a witness for Christ in your own power. But follow along with me. God wants to give you his power to be his witness. Look what the Apostle Paul said here. And, and, and Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, My message, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. I spoke to you in a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in human wisdom, but in God's power. Here's what Paul is saying. I'm not a very good communicator. I don't speak very well. I'm not the best orator. I'm not, I'm, I'm, the most, I'm not the most articulate. But when I did speak to you, I spoke to you with the power of God so that your faith would not be in me, that your faith would be in the power of God. This, this, is, this is so important because have you ever felt like, I don't feel good enough? I'm not qualified. I don't have the ability. I'm not a very good speaker. I don't know what to say. I don't know if I could do it. We all often feel unqualified, but here's what I'm trying to say. God is the one who qualifies you if I learn just to hear and yield. When, when I remember the first time I ever spoke publicly. Um, the pastor was having me say some things at the church, and he was wanting me to teach, and I'm saying, no, because, I mean, he saw my zeal for God. He saw my passion for God, and he was trying to encourage me because sometimes people can see stuff in us we can't see in ourselves. Uh, yes, they're trying to call it out of you, and but you get mad at them because they're trying to call greatness out of you. Come on, so, said every parent to their child. <laughs> but so he's trying to call something out of me, but I'm not. But I, but I, I would go up and do a few little things. But he always says, if you ever want to say something, you go ahead and say it. And 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 I remember one day, I I, I read this scripture. I was not I was not preparing to elaborate, to explain, or say anything. All I was going to do was read the scripture and go to the next part of the service. That was it. When I got through reading that passage of scripture, I hope you don't think less of me when I tell you this story. Because it was like weird, okay? It was like, it was like really, really weird. Because when I got done, all of a sudden it was like an out-of-body experience. I, I was like, it's like I had no notes. I wouldn't plan on saying anything. All of a sudden... This person starts talking, and I feel like, who is this person? Because if you knew my temperament, you knew my personality, if, 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 I were to, if I was a young person to list out 20 things I wanted to do with my life, public speaking would not have made the top 20. 
public leadership would have not made the top 20. It's not in my temperament. It's not in my personality. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, nudging me, moving me in this direction that was contrary to the bent in life I wanted to go. But I learned to yield to that bent. And all of a sudden, that day, God did something explosive in me that shaped me to this day. I know some of you feel like, no, I'm too threatened. See, see, God wants to give you boldness. But you're not physically paralyzed, but you're emotionally and mentally paralyzed. And you can't, just like a person who might be paralyzed, would want to get up out of a chair and walk across the room. You say, I can't get up because of mental and emotional paralysis. The disciples were dealing with this. Look at Acts chapter 4. Look at this verse. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, now, Lord, look at their threats. God's like, this is, sometimes you just got to read between the line to see the humor in Scripture. The people who are making threats to the disciples happen to be the same people who killed Jesus. So they're, Jesus, you know these people are not kidding. This is not an empty threat. This is not like if you talk about Jesus, we're going to fire you. If you talk about Jesus, we're going to get mad at you. No, if you talk about Jesus, we will throw you in jail. We will beat you, and then we will kill you. Are we clear? Yes, we're very clear. So, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants protection. No, grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal. This is a group of people who wouldn't stand by Jesus when he was going to the cross, when he was in the garden, and now at the face of the threat of their life, they weren't running for their own life. It was when Jesus was being threatened they were gone. Now they've got their own threat. Oh, I'm all fired up. I don't know why I'm yelling. i got a microphone. Come on, somebody. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And, that, and they were filled, watch this, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. Where did the boldness come from? By the Spirit. In their own power. This is a group of cowards that can't stand with Jesus, but with the power of the Holy Spirit in the face of their own martyrdom, they found a courage to stand up and be the witness that God wanted them to be. God's not asking you to do it in your own power. He's not asking me to do it in my power. But for you to step in your identity, for you to step into your calling, it's going to require a boldness that you don't have. I'm not talking about your person. Some people have bold personalities. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking to you. God might be wanting you to sit down and say, I can. He'll give you the power to sit down. I'm not talking to you right now. I don't even want you to say amen right now. <laughs> I'm talking to those who don't think we can do this, people like me. This was never easy for me. This is not what my mind is wired towards, but it's the voice of the Spirit. And that's why if I say something today that helps you, if I say something today that releases healing into your life, releases hope in your life, it wasn't because I came to you with persuasive words of man's wisdom, but by the demonstration of the power of God. And I've allowed that if I open my mouth and I share the encouraging word of God, he does miracles with it. And I'm telling you the same thing. Some of you, God's just asking you to walk across the room and befriend somebody in the office, and you're paralyzed because you don't have the power. And God is saying, I know you don't, but I do. And I will give you the power to walk across that room and get out of your mental, emotional paralysis and walk over and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Can I pray for you? Can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? Can I tell you how he's helped me? Can I, can I, he's not asking you to be his attorney. He just asks you to be his witness. He don't need you to defend him. He just needs you to tell people what he's done for you. Nothing more, nothing less. You don't need to exaggerate. You don't need to minimize. You don't need to glamorize it. You don't need to uh, marginalize it. This is who I was. This is what I did. This is how God showed up. 
Trust me. The power of God will work for you to help you be the witness and boldness that God would want you to have. And some of you need that because, listen, there are people in your life this week that need you to be bold because they're wondering, God, are you real? God, do you care? God, are you there? God, will you help me? And God's trying to get you to be his body, get you to be his voice, to get you to be his instrument of grace. Somebody is waiting on the other side of your obedience, and you've heard me say that hundreds of times if you attend here, and you know that. So this is not about shame. It's okay to say, but God, I know that, I know that, I know that, but God, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. God says, I know. Let me give you the power. Let me give you the power to find the boldness that I need you to be to be my witness. Here's number two. Here's number two. He empowers us in our weaknesses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is talking about this messenger of the devil that had been sent to buffet him. Have you ever been to a buffet? You ever been to just wait, you know, at a buffet? What do you do at a buffet? You just keep going back and back and back. The whole idea, if you go to a buffet, the whole idea is to do it more than one time. <laughs> That's, that's what Paul's saying. The buffet means blow after blow. He's, he, he goes, the, there, was an, there was an enemy sent that blow. He, he just kept coming back. He just wanted one more pound of flesh. Just one more problem. You ever been in a sense? It's just one more thing, just one more thing, just blow after blow after blow after blow. And he said, I prayed that God would take this problem away. It's just too much. And this was his answer. This was God's answer. He says, Paul, my grace, my grace, my grace, my grace, Paul. Is sufficient for you. For my strength, Paul, is made perfect in your weakness. Now listen carefully. Weakness, physical weakness, physical weakness means pain in my body. Pain in my body will also create pain in my head. But emotional weakness means pain in my heart, pain in my soul. That too will also create pain in my head. He's saying, God is saying, whether it's physical weakness or emotional weakness, my strength is perfected in your weakness, if you understand this. Paul says, therefore, most gladly then, because now I understand it. God, I get you. I get it. I get it, God. I get it. I will rather boast, rejoice in my infirmities that the power, the power, the power of Christ may rest on me. In other words, God, I'm just waiting for you to show up. I'm just waiting for you to show up. That I may take pleasure in infirmities. The word infirmities means it's a feebleness. Have you ever just felt like, I just don't have the strength for this. I don't have the mental strength. I don't have the physical strength. I don't have the emotional strength. God is saying, when you are infirmed, I will give you my power in reproaches. Reproaches deal with insults. This is when you take those hits to the heart. Have you ever tried to love somebody and the way they respond to you is they become your critic. You try to love them and they hate you. Then you try to help them and they curse you. And, and there's people you love that you feel like, why are you trying to do me so hard? Trust me, if you step into this thing called the arena of Christian life, God's going to cause you to live on mission. God's going to call you to love people. And when you step out living on mission and start loving people, you're going to find all kind of critics. You're going to find all kind of people who questioned your motives. And, and here's what he's saying. I will give you the power. I will give you the power to continue in ministry when your heart has been crushed by the people that you love. I will give you the power to continue when you've been rejected by the very people you care about. Have you ever met an offended Christian? An offended Christian is a Christian who's not living in the power of the Holy Spirit because they're stuck because they're stuck in their own problem solving. They're stuck in their own ability. Because when the voice of the Spirit, watch this, when the voice of the Spirit blows across you and says, love your enemy, it's like, no, no. God, I don't, I don't even want to try to love my enemy. I want to kill my enemy. If I kill them quickly, that would be an act of kindness. I would like to kill them slowly. Am I the only one that feels that way? 
I think this is why I like revenge movies so much because I don't get to have revenge on people. So I just fantasize it by watching revenge movies. And my wife knows this. If the person doing the revenging is getting too victimized in the revenge, I get frustrated at the movie. Just being honest. The only way I can love my enemy is by the head. God, you, if you want me to love this person, you've got to help me because I don't have it. I need your power. I hear you. I surrender to you, but I can't do it. I'm not even going to try to do it without you. You want me to bless my critic? I want to slap my critics. You want me to love those who persecute me and pray for those who spitefully use me when I've opened my heart and given my heart and thrown my heart out there? That's what I want. Just want me to endure it. No, 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 no. I don't want you to endure it. I want you to bless. That's not enduring. I want you to forgive those who have hurt you. See, some of you are stuck in these places. Because you've been trying to move the rock in your own power. You know what the Word says. You know what God's telling you to do. But you've been trying to do it in your own power. And listen, in your own power, it's just going to make you sick and frustrating. Because you're going to feel like this isn't working. This won't work. And you get disillusioned in faith. God never asked you to do it in your own power. It's okay to say, God, if you want me to love this person, you're going to have to help me, God. No, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, I've been doing ministry a long time. My whole life is people, and I will tell you, I'm still sweet on people. I've not become jaded. I've not become cynical. I still bless. I don't defend myself. I just love, but I shared in past lessons, that's not something I possess. I've learned how to say, God, if you want me to do something, then God, I need your help to do it. I can't, I'm not even going to try to do it. And that's a sweet spot. I'm trying to get you to learn and to live in the sweet spot of learning to recognize. It goes on to say, and, and needs, not just physical needs. This means to be without support. There'll be times in your life you'll feel like you have no one there for you. There's no support for you. In the Garden of Eden, Jesus had no one, or not, excuse me, in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, everybody abandoned Jesus. John, the revelator, ended up on the Isle of Patmos alone by himself after being boiled in oil and his torture. Uh, David, the anointed to be kings in a cave, Elijah's in a cave, Paul spent many of his years in a prison. There's a sense you're going to feel like I have no emotional support. I'm in the pain because I don't feel supported. But God says, that's all right, I got you. I got you, and I'm with you, and I'll strengthen you through this persecution to live under threat. Some of you are under threat right now. God says, I'll give you the power to get through what's threatening you in distress. Stress means just to be boxed in under so much pressure. If you ever had so much pressure, it just took your breath away. Panic attacks almost. I, 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 can't, I can't breathe. Do you know the Bible says that in those places, he'll make you strong. In fact, in fact, the Holy Spirit was sent to help you, and he will even pray for you when you can't pray for yourself. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that when I'm weak, God, I need your help to help me get through this whether it's infirmity, reproaches, needs, persecution, I distress this. Here's number three. He empowers us with hope in hopeless situations. He empowers us with hope in hopeless situations. Most of us live with limited hope, hope that expires. Think of hope like soap. How I many know that when you're dirty and you go take a shower and you got a fresh bar of soap, you've got hope that you'll get clean. But the more you use that soap, the less hope or soap you have. You can eventually reach the point where you have no more soap to get clean and you can lose your hope. What are you saying, Pastor? If my hope is in my physical strength, my physical vitality, I got this. It's a limited hope. Because what happens when I get a doctor's report that says I have a disease or I have an accident that somehow affects me or, or, or maybe something no longer works? Once my health, if my hope was in my vitality, but my vitality begins to wane, do I still continue in hope? 
if my hope is in my wealth because I've invested well, I've budgeted well, I've got the right insurance, I've got the right trust, I've got the right wheels, I've done well. But as long as you have that, you can have hope in your future security. But suppose, like the Bible says, it can all be blown away. Some change of fortune happens for you and, and somehow it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Will you still continue in hope? Or if your hope is in people and those people let you down or they leave you by the way of the grave or somehow change their attitude towards you, do you continue in hope? Look what the scripture says here in Romans chapter 15. It says, may the God of what? He's the God of hope. It's what he does. He's the God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. See, if I put my hope in anything other than the God of hope, I'm putting my hope in something that has a limited lifespan. If I put my hope in God, there's an unlimited supply of hope. It says, so that he may, that, that you may overflow with what? Hope by the power. How do I overflow with hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me break this down. The Holy Hope inspires us. Hope inspires us. Hope inspires continuation. I'm going to try a little bit more. Hope inspires creativity in my problem solving. How many know sometimes when you run into a problem and you can't solve it, we begin to get conditioned to say it's never going to change. And so we sit down and we quit and we just accept certain things. But when we have hope, we just, if I can't get through it, then I'm going to get around it. And if I can't get around it, I'm going to go over it. If I can't go over it, I'm going to get under it. And you just keep slugging away at this problem. You keep slugging. Maybe it's a relationship problem or a financial problem or a leadership problem or a, 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 I don't care what kind of health problem. You just keep slugging away at this thing. You keep slugging away at this thing. And people look at you and it's like, what are you doing? I don't know. I just, I, I just can't quit. I just, I got more hope than I got problem. Because see, when you lose your hope, you have learned to become hopeless. And there's this thing called learned helplessness that produces learned hopelessness and they call it the emotional cycle of doom. I keep running into this problem. It never changes. So life don't change for me, so I'm not a problem solver. I don't even try anymore. I just sit down. Oh, there's a problem. I sit down. There's a problem. I sit down. But God wants to put hope in you that just keeps you grinding. Just keeps you you moving. If that don't work, I'm going to try this. If that won't work, I'm going to try this because I just can't quit. I've just got this hope and it's not your hope. It's a hope given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And 2 Kings chapter 7 is a story of four lepers. That's bad. It's a skin disease. It's bad. And these lepers are outside of the city which is under siege by a massive army. And the army has cut them off. So they got no water. They got no food. They're all starving to death. So the lepers say, if we stay here, we will die. We have no hope. If we go into the city, we will die. Because they're going to die. If we go to the camp of the enemy, who, by the way, is here to kill us, and we're already social outcasts, we already don't fit in with our own people, but at least they have some food and waters and just maybe, just maybe, they'll give us something. So these four lepers, just use your imagination, like four homeless guys with everything they've got, their shopping cart, their diseases, their ratty, tatty junk, they start moving towards the camp of the enemy. But when the enemy heard them coming, they don't hear four lepers coming. God caused the camp of the enemy to hear the sound of a mighty army. And they said, the, the Israelites have hired the Egyptians to fight for them and have come to fight us. And they got up. The Bible says they didn't even pack their stuff. They just got up from the dinner table. They didn't even get on their horses. They just started running away. Thousands of them running away because four homeless guys who were about to die but refused to live hopeless. 
They only had this much hope. It don't look good anywhere for us. But they had more hope than the covenant people. They had more hope than the people who were saying that they trusted God. They had more hope because they weren't hopeless. And when they got there, the table was set when they ate like kings. They like, this is cool. And it's like, hey, let's take some plunder. They took plunder and buried it. It's like nothing yet. And so they got some more plunder and buried some more plunder. And there's still massive amounts. You know what? This isn't right. We need to go tell the people back in the city. Listen carefully. God wants to take your hopeless situation. And when you trust in the God of hope, he's going to use your hopeless situation to bring hope and healing to somebody else. Because if God would help you and God would come through for you and God would resource you, then maybe God would help me and God would resource me because he is the God of hope. Here's number four. Here's number four. My time is up. He wants to empower us to experience the fullness of Christ. If you were to ask most Christians, how are you really doing? Most Christians, would, if they were honest, they would sit there and say, there's got to be more. They don't publicly talk that way because that's not the party line. That's not what we're supposed to say. We're supposed to say we're victorious and we got it all figured out and God's large and in charge and that's what we're supposed to say. But, but if we were really honest, we would say there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And I got good news for you. There is more. The problem is we're not living to the fullness of Christ, which, is a, which by the way, is a work of the power of the Holy Spirit. We live at the lowest common denominators. What do you mean by that, Pastor? We, 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 we pray the salvation prayer so we can check the box. We go to church and join the church and fill out the paper so we can check the box. We read our Bible a couple times a week. would hope to do it every day, but we read a couple times, check the box. I talk to God, I pray, check the box. Try to be a good person and help and serve where I can, check the box. Try to honor God with my budget and try to tithe. If not, I try to give. I try to be generous. God knows I'm struggling, but I check the box. But at the end of the day, you still feel empty. You still feel like something is missing. Because to do so is to reduce Christianity to lowest common denominators. And reducing your faith to the lowest common denominators will not cause you to live in the fullness of God. Look what the apostle says here in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I pray that you, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power, strengthen you with power. He gives you the power through his spirit in your inner being. A lot of the work of the Holy Spirit is strengthening my inner person so that I can handle what I need to handle. It's strengthening my inner person so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, that you may have the power, have the power, you have the power together with all of the Lord's holy people, not just you, but all of God's people to grasp. Power to grasp. Power to grasp. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ to know the love that surpasses knowledge. Here's what he's saying. I pray that you would have the power to know just how much God loves you. Here's what you need to understand. Scripture was given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You have to understand the connection between the Holy Spirit's work and the Word of God. So when you read the Word of God, you read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit then breathes it back onto us. When he breezes it back onto us, it becomes revelation or it becomes revealed. I can sit here and talk to you all day long about how much God loves you, how much God loves you, and it might not penetrate your heart and your head. But if the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, it's like, and you grasp it, it is overwhelming to know how much God loves you. 
when the Holy Spirit is the revealer. See, if I preach the gospel to you today and, and, and you feel the conviction that says, I need to get right with God, that's the work of the Holy Spirit taking the words I've said. He's convicting those words. He's the revealer of truth. He's the revealer. He's the revealer of the truth of your identity. Only He can reveal to you who you truly are in God. I can sit there and give you all the positive affirmations and give you all the quotations and you can put all the things on the wall that you want to put on to build your self-worth and build your self-identity, build your self-esteem, by the way, which are great, do them. But what's better than that is saying, Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. Just how much you love me. Reveal to me who I am. This is not the Punch list, I punch and checklist and check the box. No, no. Is, oh, I did that. That's just what I do. I go to church because that's who I am. I love people because that's what I do. I, I, I do these things because that's what I was wired for. I'm just living in my identity. You're revealing to me what my mission is. My mission is. No, you don't understand this. When I was a young believer coming out of craziness, I left it all behind, and I'm, I'm in a place. And I'm trying to serve God, and I'm just experiencing this incredible emptiness in my life. And I'm sitting there saying, God, there's got to be more. I remember talking to a friend that I'd been witnessing to, and he's, he's coming to me, and he's saying to me, there's got to be more. And I'll never forget, I'm the Christian. I'm sitting there saying, I know, there's got to be more. And I'm supposed to be telling you about Jesus. And I'm not sure I should tell you about Jesus because it's not been more for me yet. I know I'm supposed to tell you he's more. But I would be just saying what I'm supposed to say versus telling you the truth for me. And I remember that. It's like, God. And it ended up, within a few days, I was in this church service. And the pastor sp spoke out of Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, people perish. And that day, that day, the Holy Spirit revealed to me God had a mission for my life. And I heard it, and I yielded to it. And for the last 35 plus years of my life, I've been following that vision for my life. It bends me in a different direction. It leads me in a different way than my personality. It leads me in a different way than I would have chosen for myself. But I will tell you, I will tell you it's led to the fullness of God. I'm not saying that I've arrived. I'm not saying my behavior is perfect. I'm not saying I don't have a lot of growth areas. I'm just saying I'm not checking the boxes. And I want you to know, I want you to know, God wants you to grasp just how much he loves you. He wants you to grasp that your identity, who you are, to sit across the seat from your creator, have him look in your eyes and call out of you who you are is life changing. To speak into your, your mission. This is what your assignment is. This is what you were created for. The, I, I, for I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you. God created you for a mission. And it isn't to build your retirement plan and build your house. and You can do all those. Those natural things are good and wonderful. But you will never find the fulfillment that God wants you to find living anything other than what you were created for. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. Hey, guys, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. Thank you for letting me preach my heart out to you today. But I want to pray for you because some of you are here and you need that boldness. You would be honest and say, Pastor, I lack the boldness. I, I want to. I want to. I just lack the boldness to step out and step into. Others of you, Pastor, I'm struggling in my weaknesses. I, I, you, you talked about being offended. I am offended. You talked about unforgiveness. I, I, there's no way I can love this person. There's no way I can forgive this person. And you're stuck. I get it. I'm not asking you to do it in your own power. He's not asking you to do it in your own power. Others of you might be in a situation. You've, it's just become hopeless for you. You feel this marriage is hopeless. You feel my life is hopeless. You feel my career and my vocation is just hopeless hopeless. I don't, my ministry is hopeless. You just feel so hopeless. You, you're just overwhelmed with this sense of hopelessness. God wants to be the God of hope for you that overflows, 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 overflows. 
others of you, you've been struggling in this nominal Christianity thing, and God's calling you to so much more. We're going to go back into this course, but I'm going to invite our pastors and team to come. If you need prayer for anything, we're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray over you right now. But if you need prayer for your body, you need prayer for the other things I just mentioned. But I also want to say this. If you're here and you've not invited Jesus into your life, would you do that right now? Just say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. If you're watching online, just say, God, I invite you into my life. I invite you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I put my trust in you. If you need to reconnect with him, reach out to that. But as we sing this course, there's men and women here that would love to pray for you because you should not leave the same way you come because this is a house of prayer and we are a people of prayer and God still does miracles in people's lives today. So if you need prayer, you come as we worship.